bear in mind temperatures will drop sharply so it'll turn pretty cold pretty uh, quickly the breeze will pick up across southern parts of england and wales and strengthen further over northern scotland and with more wind around so won't see as much fog and it won't be quite as cold temperatures holding up above freezing in towns and cities but some mist and low cloud is likely across parts of northeast england so that will make for a bit of a, a gray start here on saturday a chilly start generally but a cracking start again if you like blue skies a sunny day but with more of a breeze certainly across the south perhaps not feeling quite as warm as uh, today but in Scotland temperatures will be higher and we could in the highlands get up to 19 possibly even 20 celsius for the first time this year it'll turn quite cool quite quickly again on saturday evening so again just bear that in mind if you're heading out it will turn pretty chilly after a fine afternoon the breeze continues to keep temperatures up a little bit overnight and stop a frost forming too widely but there will be some pockets of frost on sunday a cloudier day for eastern england on sunday with some showers for east anglia but otherwise dry and bright but again a little cooler come the afternoon GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome to The Briefing with me, Isabel Oakeshott. Earlier, I sat down with former Defence Minister Liam Fox, well, he's Defence Secretary, actually, to discuss whether Britain has left itself at the mercy of President Putin for our energy supplies. Have we made a catastrophic error? We will speak to the man also who predicted the 2008 economic meltdown. He'll tell us what he thinks the sanctions against Russia mean for the West and why the way we're punishing President Putin, in his opinion, could be a big mistake. And it's Tory party conference weekend in Blackpool. We'll bring you the latest developments throughout the programme. We'll have all of this and so much more this hour, but first, it's the latest GB News headlines. Good afternoon, it's one minute past 12. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Ukraine is hoping to evacuate civilians from areas on the front line of fighting after nine humanitarian corridors were agreed with Russia. In the west of the country, several blasts have been heard in the city of Lviv, with the mayor saying missiles have hit an aircraft repair plant. No casualties have been reported. In Donetsk, in eastern Ukraine, an unknown number of people were killed when a residential building was shelled. Former world boxing heavyweight champion Vladimir Klitschko, who's in the capital with his brother, the mayor of Kiev, says his country needs help. Life is getting lost. 
not just the infrastructure, life is getting lost. This is genocide of the Ukrainian population. You have to act now. Stop passively observing and stop doing business with Russia. Do it now. Journalist Lydia Hushva, who fled Kiev and is now living in Dnipro in central Ukraine, says the city is flooded with military personnel. I'm from Kiev originally, and now I'm in Dnipro. I'm checking every day if my flat still exists, which is in Kiev. And I call my friends and ask if they are alive. Every street, some signs, uh, some sandbags, uh, some uh, metal stuff to stop vehicles. And uh, if you want to go outside the city, you see checkpoints, uh, you see police in the city. Russia today has had its license to broadcast in the UK revoked with immediate effect. Ofcom says it's not satisfied that RT can be a responsible broadcaster. With its headquarters in Moscow, the company accused the media regulator of simply being a tool for the British government and that the public's being robbed of information. Former Ofcom adviser Martin Campbell described the decision as patronising. OK, RT, Russia Today, there is a clue in the title as to, as to what you're going to get. And the, the idea that no one can put it in, into perspective is, is a little bit crazy. So, I mean, like, like so many things uh, that, that, that have happened because of this invasion, it, it hasn't been handled very well. More than 150,000 people registered for the Homes for Ukraine scheme ahead of today's launch. The government programme aims to match refugees with people and companies who can provide accommodation for at least six months. Ukrainians with a sponsor here can start their visa application immediately. Those with no ties to the country will be matched at a later stage. In other news, demonstrations are being held in Dover, Liverpool and Hull to protest against the sacking of hundreds of seafarers by p and ferries. 800 staff were made redundant via video message after the firm made a loss of £100 million last year. Politicians and unions have condemned the move, with the Rail, Maritime and Transport Union seeking legal advice. Shadow Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Secretary Jim McCann is calling on the government to challenge the decision. I just think the way that PL have behaved is a national disgrace. It's an absolute scandal that 800 people were told that they would be sacked on the same day by a video call. These are 800 people who have bills to pay, who have families to support, who have whole communities who depend on that industry. Uh, and frankly, it's a national scandal that it's been allowed to happen on the government's watch. Sarah Everard's killer, Wayne Cousins, has been charged with indecent exposure. The Crown Prosecution Service says he's been accused of committing four offences in January and February of last year. He's currently serving a whole life sentence for the abduction, rape and murder of Ms Everard in March 2021. He'll appear at Westminster Magistrates Court next month. And Bristol Rovers manager Joey Barton is on trial at Wimbledon Magistrates Court, accused of assaulting his wife. The incident allegedly took place at a house in South West London in June last year. At an earlier hearing, the court heard his wife sustained a head injury. He's pleaded not guilty to the charges. And all remaining UK COVID travel restrictions have now been lifted. That's despite figures showing infections are rising across the country for the first time since January. The Department for Transport says a range of contingency measures will be kept in place so ministers can take swift action in the event of new variants. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now it's back to the briefing with Isabella Oakeshott. Well, coming up this hour on The Briefing, a backlash against p and ferries is growing after the firm sacked 800 staff without giving them any notice. Protests are set to be held against the firm across the country today. We'll get the latest from GB News reporter Anna Riley, who's been following the story. And I've been speaking to former Defence Secretary Liam Fox MP. It's a wide-ranging interview looking at the need for Britain not to depend on despots for energy and how the conflict in Ukraine has shaken the world order. And will sanctions against Russia backfire on us? We'll speak to a former CIA advisor who thinks the sanctions may be a mistake.
give me your political briefing, send in your views and opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. So, have you been wondering how you can help with the situation in Ukraine? And did you hear about the lady from Manchester who was so keen to do something that having had a few too many drinks to celebrate her birthday, she ordered an Uber all the way from Manchester to Ukraine so she could go and help out? Uber said it would cost her £4,500 and after several pink gins, she accepted the fare. Now, luckily for this lady, Uber wasn't actually able to take the money as she had insufficient funds in her bank. And the bank, quite unsurprisingly, thought there was some kind of fraud going on and so the transaction was declined. So though this lady woke up with a very sore head, she didn't at least wake up halfway across Germany en route to Kyiv. What she could do, like the rest of us, is volunteer to have a Ukrainian in her own home. Now, amazingly, 150,000 British people have signed up to offer their homes to one or more Ukrainian refugees. Now, of course, not everybody has the space to do that, but I do. Uh, I'm one of the people that is very, very keen to help in that way. I'm lucky enough to have room in my house, perhaps for a, a mother and child, and I'd really love that to happen. But what I want to say today is that I'm not convinced that anything like 150,000 Ukrainians will actually want to come to Britain. And here is why. Britain is a very long way away from Ukraine. And what I learned when I was on the Polish border this time last week with GB News is that most of these refugees just want to go home as soon as possible. I saw good people from Germany, from the Netherlands, from Denmark, trying to persuade refugees to get on coaches and minibuses for a new life in those countries. People with signs up saying, you know, I have space to take you. And you know what? There wasn't actually a stampede for this transport. Far from it. By and large, as you've seen from the pictures there, these people didn't actually want to go anywhere. Uh, they seemed content, uh, perhaps very unhappily, of course, but they wanted to just wait in the refugee centres to see if it might be possible not to go quite as far away. Why? Because these people are not economic migrants. They are fleeing war. They have left brothers, husbands, fathers at home. And what they really want is for all this to be over fast so that they can go back and rebuild their lives. Now, that might not be very realistic in the short term. Most are probably going to realise soon that they'll have to find somewhere else to go for a while. But I think the nearer the home, the nearer to their home, the better for them. So what should we do? Well, I think we should support the countries nearest Ukraine to take as many as they can. Of course, we should also take anyone who really, really wants to come to the UK. And I'm first in line, I hope, for somebody to come to our house. But we need to be conscious that a permanent exodus of Ukrainians from Ukraine is not actually what the Ukrainians want either. After all, it only achieves Putin's objectives for him by Russifying Ukraine, which is exactly what he's trying to do with his bonds. So protests against P&O ferries are being held across the country today after the firm sacked 800 people yesterday without any prior notice. The RMT union said it was one of the most shameful acts in the history of British industrial relations. And there are protests today planned across the ports of Dover, Liverpool, Hull and Larne. So let's speak to our GB News reporter, Anna Riley in Hull. And uh, these are areas, uh, I think, Hull, where protests are being held today. And I think we might have a second reporter, also Ellie Costello, in Dover. Good to see you both. Um, uh, Anna, first, what is going on where you are? Um, what's the mood like? And are people beginning to gather in some number? 
Good afternoon, Isabel. Yes, there's certainly a lot of frustration being felt here by the workers and by union members who are standing in solidarity with the seafarers that were told with no notice yesterday that they'd lost their jobs via a Zoom call. The, the ship here is the pride of Hull and the, once the staff were told that information, they launched a sit-in yesterday until terms were discussed about their exit package and they left at about half past four yesterday afternoon after having that sit-in but they've returned today in numbers I don't know if you can see behind me here but there is a real gathering there must be about 50 or 60 people I'd say um, that have turned out in numbers they're going to start the uh, the protest in full at about 20 past 12. They're going to march into the port area where the passengers go. There are police as well on board on, um, at the, the security gates, so it's unsure whether they'll get past, but that is the plan that they'll go through there. And they're, they're just angry. I mean, there is a calm mood here at the moment, but there's just that frustration that some people who have worked for P&O Ferries, for the, the whole of their lives, they were just given no notice and told that that was that. There was agency staff set to replace them as well, uh, waiting to go on board as the other staff came off. Um, the Hull MPs are totally backing the workers here as well. They've called for the Pride of Hull to be stripped of its name if P&O don't reverse their decision to sack the 800 British seafarers. And services, they're unable to run for the next few days as well. So, obviously, this has a, a knock-on impact for passengers as well. p and was saying um, if it's I want not to... essential to travel, then don't. Uh, I want to uh, hop over to Ellie there to find out whether it's very much the same picture where you are, Ellie. Hi, Isabel. Well, this protest started here about 10 minutes ago, and I'd say there's a good 300 people here. I'll let the camera pan around for you so you can see. As you can see, uh, unionists here from the RMT are delivering speeches right now. There are lots of people here who are on those ferries in Dover. Yesterday, they received a two-minute pre-recorded message on Zoom to let them know that their jobs were terminating effective yesterday. Today, they are still reeling from that shock. I'm reading some of these signs here. It says resist all PO job cuts. It says occupy and nationalize. And you can see that there's loads of flags here and banners. People are calling on PO to reverse their decision. And Dover is the home of PO ferries in the United Kingdom. 14 crosses to Calais every single day. And at the moment, just over to my right are three ferries that are docked there. They are currently uh, being used with um, agency workers, but the British staff were escorted off by security yesterday. Uh, we have been told that those security officers had handcuffs with them and some of them were wearing balaclavas as they removed British staff from those ships. Some of those members of staff have worked for PO for over 20 years. They are absolutely devastated and that is why they're gathering in Dover right now. We are Indeed. expecting that we may be blocking some roads in the next few minutes. We'll keep you um, posted as, as the day moves on as well. Indeed. Ellie and Anna, thank you very much for that. I mean, just a shocking story. Is this the worst self-inflicted PR disaster in corporate history? I don't know. I thought it was a spoof when I first heard about it. Anyway, moving back now to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that has thrown a sharp spotlight on the extent to which we in the West and Britain depend on Russia for oil and gas. Yesterday, I sat down with former Defence Secretary Dr Liam Fox to hear his views on how we can cut ties with hostile states when it comes to our energy supplies. He is an expert on this issue. So you've just written a very chunky report on UK energy security. Why did you decide to look into that in a deep dive kind of way? Actually, it was a follow-up to a report I'd written as Shadow Defence Secretary back in 2006-07. At the time, it was called Over a Barrel, and it said unless we get an energy security policy that looks at diversity of supply, sooner or later, geopolitics will catch up with us. We did the second one because we wanted to add in the debate about decarbonisation. Um, and one of the things 
that for me was most important was to try to get away from the debate just about electricity generation. Mm. Um, and we keep on talking about 52% of our electricity generations from renewables. That's great. But only 19% of our energy uh, usage is electricity. It's 44% oil for transport and industry and 31% gas. And as long as we're going to use um, fossil fuels, we've got to be much more circumspect about where we get them. And you mentioned that your report, that your first report was called Over a Barrel. Is Over a Barrel where we are now? Yes. Uh, and, and, and I don't think that was unpredictable either. Um, I think it's come late to uh, m many politicians um, that we got ourselves into this position. When we wrote the, the, the most recent one, we were very critical of Germany and Nord Stream 2, saying that it would make not just Germany more dependent on Russian gas, but through Germany, the European Union and indirectly countries like the UK. And I think, so I think the key message from it all was global uh, problems require global solutions. And one country going off in its own direction can indirectly harm uh, even its friends and allies. So diesel is now at two pounds at some petrol stations. Um, unleaded is heading that way as well. How bad do you think this is going to get? I, this is important to everybody here. It's a very tangible kind of uh, sign of where things are going. How bad do you think these fuel prices are going to get at the pumps? Well, you have a, a double um, hit here. You, we already had high fuel prices because of the pace of recovery from the pandemic was higher than expected. Supplies weren't as high as they were expected and you'd a mismatch of supply and demand. So prices were already up there. Ukraine's caused another shock in that system. We've seen, of course, um, uh, Brent crude and others come off the top in terms of price. That may now ease, particularly if we get any sort of peace agreement in Ukraine. But the shock's still there now in the system. Um, I, I was uh, listening, in fact, last night to Mervyn King, Lord, Lord King, who actually said that the increase in the prices that we're paying because of Ukraine and the knock-on effect was, an, was in effect an external tax being imposed on all of us because of our own response to Ukraine. And he's absolutely right. His view was that's something that we should be willing to bear because it's, it's how we help contribute to the fall of the Putin regime. But um, nonetheless, that, that's caused a lot of hardship uh, to families up and down the country. That's a really interesting kind of gloss to put on it for people who are filling up their cars and it's £100 to fill up a small you know, family car. Um, was he saying and are you suggesting that people should almost sort of see that as, as their contribution to the, to the war effort? I, I think it's, it's, it's inevitable that there is some um, element of that. But, but in the bigger picture, we haven't diversified enough mm -hmm. to ensure that we have both energy security and in the decarbonisation debate that we don't introduce unnecessarily high fuel prices to people. I think all of these things now will require a rethink. I mean, I think that the pandemic was putting a whole lot of different pressures on us. I think the war in Ukraine uh, will, will add to that. And I think we do need to, to rethink the pace at which we're moving some of these policies. And regarding where we are now with Russia, do you think the Foreign Office and the Ministry of Defence have been kind of culpably complacent over the years uh, about the threat from President Putin? No, no, I don't. Um, I think that the West in general um, hasn't understood what Putin was saying. I mean, I, I, I quite often was you know, regarded as being a hawk and uh, a warmonger on all these things because Putin back in 2007, in the speech he gave at the Munich Security Conference, he effectively told us what he was going to do. He also gave us a, a glimpse of his bizarre worldview that the fall of the Berlin Wall was a conscious choice by the Russian people, he said, to be able to bring more openness and democracy to Europe. I mean, it's, it, it does take quite, it does take quite a leap. reaction, it does yeah. take a little mm -hmm. bit of a, you yeah. know, a leap of faith to, to even grasp where he's coming from. Mm. But, but we got Chechnya, Georgia, annexation of Crimea. I mean, how many warnings yeah. Did we need yeah. to, to say that Putin is not mad, Putin is bad, but, could but the he's UK consistently have done bad. More? Could the UK have done more over the years? Well, I think, I think we did far more than most. We actually paid our bills into NATO, for example, mm -hmm. um, and when other countries were not doing so. We were modernising our armed forces at a time when many others were not. And um, it is it's great to hear 
the new German Chancellor saying that Germany will now pay its full share. But we're, we're you know, more than a decade in, in arrears, as it were, and lots of other European countries still not um, spending what they want. Our enemies, our enemies see these things and they make their calculations accordingly. Then, of course, you've got the withdrawal from Afghanistan on top of all of that yeah. and the signals that that sent. So regarding the UK's energy security, what do you see as our key vulnerability? Well, our key vulnerabilities are still our, our huge dependence on imported um, oil and gas. I'd like to see us diversify. I think that uh, for an energy security policy, you've got to have three things. You've got to have diversity of the fuels you use. And that means we have to use a mixture of uh, fossil fuels, uh, renewables, nuclear, particularly things like small modular reactors and a, a British technology um, that we can actually uh, utilize. Uh, you also secondly need to have uh, security of the sources where they come from. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to have adequate maritime forces to guarantee the safety. Um, given, for example, a third of the world's oil passing through the Strait of Hormuz, where uh, Iran's hardly a friend. So where are you on the value of uh, shale gas in the UK? And do you think that people have properly understood the difference between the commodity shale gas and the methodology, which has obviously been very controversial, the fracking uh, extraction? I think in Britain, I think you're absolutely right. We have a tendency to focus on a word. Um, uh, I think the same has been true in the cladding debate in the UK, where it's it's been not about fire safety, it's been about uh, one element of that. I think the same is true in the fracking and shale gas uh, debate. I think we need to have that debate about, do we want to have more of our own resources produced in a way that we can guarantee um, in our own country? But take into account, obviously, um, we are a, a, a democracy, uh, what people think about about the process and whether you can get public acceptance for either that or, or different ways of shale gas extraction. Um, is it true, do you think, that much of the environmental campaigning against fracking many years ago was actually funded indirectly by Russian interests? I don't know enough about it to be able to, to answer that. Um, but certainly if I were uh, trying to get a monopoly on selling a particular product, I would be coming down hard on any potential competition. So Boris Johnson was in Saudi yesterday um, trying to negotiate a greater supply of energy from the Gulf. What implications do you think that has for the UK's energy security? Do you think that was a good move? Yes. Um, as I said, diversity of supply is key. Um, Europe became too dependent on Russian gas. Therefore, Putin had a lever over Europe. Um, I do think that he believed that Europe would react in the way that it, that it has. Um, but nonetheless, it was there. And I think that um, we, we, it's not a question of using more fossil fuel. And I hear, you know, the green lobby going crazy about the fact that, um, oh, we shouldn't be increasing fuel production. It's not about increasing fuel usage. It's um, most of us recognize that we're on this path to decarbonization. But it's about while we're dependent on fossil fuels, while we need to use them, actually getting diversity of supply and therefore security. And there was quite predictably enough, a lot of criticism of that trip, um, primarily but not exclusively from the left, uh, because of Saudi's military activities in Yemen and human rights questions. Is that parallel with Russia fair? Absolutely not. Um, so uh, there are not many people more anti-death penalty than I am. Mm. Um, but you have to remember that when it comes to the war in Yemen, that this was a war taken to the Saudis by the Iranian-backed Houthis, mm. um, including firing missiles um, into uh, close to Riyadh. So um, what were the Saudis supposed to do? Just allow their people to be attacked? So there's, it's, it's always strikes me something odd about Western media, that they're very willing to attack Saudi Arabia, but very reticent about attacking Iran's backing uh, of the people who actually took the war to the Saudis. Leaving both those aside... The, the primary job of any government is the protection of its own people and the security of its own people, and that includes energy security. So the Prime Minister was 100% justified in the visit that he made to the UAE and to Saudi. And where are you on net zero? Do you agree with the time frame that's been set uh, for the UK in particular? Well, I think there's a problem in setting a time frame. Um, on, in other words, 
setting a time at which you will reach your destination without having a roadmap of how you get there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the aim is absolutely right. I think we should be aiming for decarbonisation. We should be aiming for net zero, but we need to know how we'll get there. Um, and so uh, we need to know the rate at which we will be developing um, other forms of energy generation. So, for example, in nuclear, where I think big new power stations like Hinkley, the one close to me in Somerset, um, I think that will be the last of its kind. I think we will look to other forms of nuclear generation, particularly things like small modular uh, reactors. But we need to know what that mix will be. Um, and wishful thinking is, is no more a useful instrument in energy security than it is in foreign policy. Is it your instinct that the time frame for net zero 2050 is too ambitious um, for, for the UK and will end up being watered down in some way just because of pure pragmatism? I think the answer to all um, our questions around uh, decarbonisation will come with technology. Uh, technology will be our answer as it always has been. Um, our ability to, uh, where we do continue to use fossil fuels, to make them uh, much greener, uh, much less polluting than they are today. Some of that technology is already in development. And how do we use other forms of energy generation? People talk about um, hydrogen, for example. We've still got some way to go on that, but clearly where we to uh, develop that, or even better, to move forward in fusion, that would actually uh, be a big answer. But technology is, and investment, therefore, in technology is a key part of, of what we will be able to do. So do you think we'll... we'll be able to do it by 2050? I don't know. Um, and because I don't know the roadmap, mm. as I say, I don't know the time we'll get to the destination. And I think plucking dates out of the air yeah. when you don't know what the, uh, what the path to that is, I think is at best a, a good guess. That is effectively what the government has done, though, isn't it? Plucked dates. Well, I think, I mean, I think, I mean, I think that they would see it as a target, you know, that that's mm. what we're trying to achieve. Mm. Whether it, in direct answer to your question, that's realistic or not, is a different debate. Liam Fox, thank you. And you'll be able to watch the full interview with Dr. Liam Fox on our YouTube channel, including his take on Putin's strategy in Ukraine. That's at youtube.com forward slash GB News. Now, coming up, We'll be talking to a former CIA advisor about economic warfare and how the sanctions on Russia could backfire against the West. But before that, a short break. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
It's 12.31. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Ukraine is hoping to evacuate civilians from areas on the front line of fighting after nine humanitarian corridors were agreed with Russia. In the west of the country, several blasts have been heard in the city of Lviv, with the mayor saying missiles have hit an aircraft repair plant. No casualties have been reported. And in the city centre, striking images of more than 100 prams, pushchairs and car seats lined up to highlight the unknown number of children killed during the invasion. Here, Russia today has had its licence to broadcast in the UK revoked with immediate effect. Ofcom says it isn't satisfied that RT is a responsible broadcaster. With its headquarters in Moscow, the company accused the regulator of simply being a tool for the British government. More than 150,000 people have registered for the Homes for Ukraine scheme ahead of today's launch. The government programme aims to match refugees and people with people and companies who can provide accommodation for at least six months. Ukrainians with a sponsor here can start their visa application immediately. Those with no ties to the country will be matched at a later stage. And in other news, demonstrations are being held in Dover, Liverpool and Hull to protest against the sacking of hundreds of P&O ferry staff. 800 workers were made redundant via a video message. Politicians and unions have condemned the move, with the Rail, Maritime and Transport Union seeking legal advice. Sarah Everard's killer Wayne Cousins has been charged with indecent exposure. The Crown Prosecution Service says he's been accused of committing four offences in January and February of last year. He's currently serving a whole life sentence for the abduction, rape and murder of Ms Everard in March 2021. He'll appear at Westminster Magistrates Court next month. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to the briefing with Isabel Oakeshott. Following President Putin's invasion of Ukraine, the West has imposed unprecedented sanctions on Russia. As we enter a new age of economic warfare, some are arguing that the sanctions on Russia may actually backfire on us. Joining me to discuss the wider implications of this type of action is the editor of Strategic Intelligence, Jim Rickards. Now, Jim Rickards negotiated the Federal Reserve bailout for the largest casualty of Russia's default in 1998. He's also advised the CIA on economic warfare, and he participated in the Pentagon's first ever financial warfare games in 2009. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, that exercise in 2009, the Pentagon's first ever financial war game sounds incredibly interesting. Can you tell us more about what that involved and what was learnt from it? Um, sure, Isabel. It, it took place in a um, top secret warfare analysis laboratory uh, about halfway between Washington and Baltimore at the uh, Applied Physics Laboratory. Um, we had you know, five teams, the ones you might expect, it was Russia, China, and, and a few other countries. I, I was one of the uh, organizers and facilitators of the game, but I also played on the, the China team. Um, but what was interesting about it is we, uh, with some help from the Russia team, we launched a um, uh, kind of an attack on the U.S. dollar, and we said, you know, Russia and China would increase their gold reserves, create a new currency backed by the gold, you know, issued from a Swiss bank, and, and just declare that from now on, if you want, Chinese manufactured goods or Russian energy, you had to pay for it in this new currency. Uh, and you could get some by putting your gold in this depository. Uh, this you know, was just 2009. It was a little bit of a stretch at the time. But we were warning the Pentagon that the continual use of economic sanctions by the United States was forcing our adversaries to work around the dollar, get out from under the dollar. Now, that was 2009, so uh, 13 years ago. What's happened since then? Uh, exactly what we predicted. Russia took its gold reserves from 600 tons to 2,300 tons. China took its gold reserves from 600 tons to about 2,000 tons, although they probably have more off the books in the State Administration of Foreign Exchange. Um, and, uh, and they're preparing, as I say, to work around these sanctions. So uh, you know, we sort of warned them 13 years ago. It's playing out as we predicted. Um, and uh, you know, we'll see where it goes from there. But you can't... Um, 
you can't overuse the sanctions. In other words, Russia is not a punching bag. You can take a punching bag, hit it, hit it, hit it, but eventually the punching bag gets out of the way. And in this case, Russia will look for ways out of the dollar system. Very interesting. I mean, you're very strong on this issue of the kind of the unintended consequences of sanctions. I wonder if you could explain uh, for our viewers um, whether you think the sanctions that have been imposed so far are actually a mistake. Would you go that far? Um, yes, because uh, because the, uh, you can say unintended consequences, but there's actually a scientific basis for this. It's called complexity theory. We don't have to get too down, you know, too much down in the weeds. But again, 1998, which was the last time Russia defaulted, I think we can expect more Russian defaults going forward. But 1998, August 17th, they did default on their external debt and uh, and, and the ruble. Um, but that actually started in Thailand in June 1997. It was kind of a run on the bank in Thailand. The bot was devalued. It spread. And by the way, the spread of financial distress is exactly like the spread of a virus. It's not just a metaphor. The, the math is the same. So that spread from Thailand to Malaysia, to Indonesia, to South Korea. And there was literally blood in the streets. People were killed in financial riots in South Korea. Uh, then there was a little bit of a quiet period. Then it popped up in Russia. And it ended up in, in my lap. We were a hedge fund in Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, but we had uh, 1.4 trillion dollars of derivatives on our books. Uh, and after the Russia default spreads wide, and so, but there's an example where you have a Thai currency crisis, and then a year later, every global market is on the verge of being closed. And that that was the case. We we got that bailout done. We got four billion dollars in cash and propped up the balance sheet. And the Fed cut interest rates, and we went on from there. But as uh, Wellington said, it was a close run thing. Um, but we were prepared for every market in the world, beginning in Tokyo, to close sequentially. So now, here we are um, in 2022, same thing's happening. What was interesting yesterday is that Russia actually paid some sovereign debt in dollars. And everyone's like, wait a second, I got some calls uh, yesterday. I thought we had sanctions. I thought we kicked them out of SWIFT. We kicked them out of the payment system. We froze their accounts. How come they got to pay dollars? Well, the answer is two things. Number one, a lot of those sanctions have delayed effective dates. They, they don't actually kick in until 30, 60, or 90 days, as the case may be. But more to the point, somebody in the Treasury, and it's always surprising when they get things right, but somebody in the Treasury woke up and said, wait a second, we don't need another financial crisis on top of a war coming out of a COVID pandemic. Uh, let's let the Russians at least pay that coupon, and then we'll take it from there. So That's there's right. a little bit less than meets the eye in these sanctions. But somebody woke up and said, let's avoid a global liquidity crisis, because that's what you're heading for if you really enforce these sanctions. And you know, beyond that, we're, gonna, we're just shutting down the supply chain. Everyone's like, you know, we're cutting off semiconductors to Russia. OK, but how do you make semiconductors? Well, you make them in part with the neon gas that is used to power the lasers that do the etching in the semiconductors. And 70% of that gas comes from Odessa, which happens to be in Ukraine. So uh, you can't, th these systems, the, the supply chain system and the financial system, densely interconnected, very complex. And you can't chop up one part without affecting all the other parts. So th this is fascinating. I love your analogy about you know, the virus. And you're, what you're, you're saying really is that this instability will spread and affect us all on a scale that I don't think people fully appreciate. So how high a price do you think the UK could pay for what is going on and the measures that have been taken against Russia? Well, you're paying it every day and, uh, for petrol, and uh, it's going to affect food. Uh, Ukraine, one of its nicknames historically is the breadbasket of Europe. Now, I don't know how much grain the UK specifically gets from Ukraine, but again, these are global markets and global prices. So whatever you're sourcing is, you're going to pay the global price. But when you look at Africa, depending on the country, somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of all the grain that those countries import comes from Ukraine. Uh, and of course, the Russians, as a matter of, of strategy, are taking over the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea ports, and they're going to cut off all exports from Ukraine. Uh, and Russia's exports themselves are cut off because of the sanctions. So how are we going to feed Lebanon and, uh, and in countries in Africa, not to mention uh, the rest of the world? And as I say, even if you're not getting your grain from Ukraine, you are paying a world price. And so if the price yes. skyrockets because of Ukraine, you'll pay that higher price. So it, it may, uh, the, the financial shock that I talked about could yet happen. We could stumble into a global liquidity crisis. But every day at the, at the grocery store, the gas pump, you're paying the price. 
Uh, Jen, I wish we had more time. I would love to ask you what you think we should be doing if it's not sanctioned. So please do come on again. Absolutely fascinating insight about the price we may pay for these sanctions. Uh, I hope we see you again uh, now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, coming up after the break, we'll cross over to Blackpool and get the latest from the Conservative Party conference. But first, it's a short break. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. It's the Conservative Party Spring Conference this weekend in Blackpool. Earlier, Chancellor Rishi Sunak spoke about the cost of living crisis. He was tight-lipped, unfortunately, on what we can expect from the spring statement on Wednesday. Uh, but perhaps we're learning a few hints from the mini-conference underway in Liverpool, uh, Blackpool even. That's where GB News political correspondent Tom Harwood joins us. Hello, Tom. All the glamour for you there in Blackpool. Casting back uh, just only a few weeks ago, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson was absolutely on a knife edge in career-wise. He looked like he was on his way out. Everything's turned around, hasn't it? What's the mood there? Pretty upbeat, I imagine. It certainly has. This is a more united Conservative Party than anyone could possibly have imagined even just a few weeks ago. Certainly high spirits. Everyone that I've spoken to seems to be pretty triumphalist going in to those May local elections that will start on the 5th of May, although uh, the higher up in the party you get, the more expectation management they hope to deploy. Interestingly, only 1,500 tickets were sold to this conference. It's not the sort of full-scale September-October affair, but it is the first spring conference that the Conservative Party is hosting in Blackpool since 2007, returning to this city that has been uh, the site of many notable moments in Tory party history. Indeed, this very conference centre is where David Cameron, in effect, launched his bid to be the Conservative Party leader with a speech at that conference with no notes that famously propelled him uh, into yeah. a real contender position. Also, William Hague in 1977, at 16 years old, gave that famous speech here as well. So a lot of Tory history here. 
I was not there for the William Hague one, but I was there for the David Cameron one, and I was surprised that the Conservatives are going back there. Uh, now, um, what is the main on the agenda? Is it uh, about cost of living? Uh, obviously, there will be a great deal of discussion about Ukraine unavoidably, but we've got the spring statement coming up. So is that what's preoccupying uh, the delegates uh, at the moment? Well, the first person to speak at the conference this morning was indeed the Chancellor Rishi Sunak, not in a speech, but in a sort of Q&A with one of the Blackpool MPs. Of course, it's the first time that the Tory party has had MPs here in Blackpool for quite some time. That might explain why they're coming back here now in that sort of uh, uh, bid for the red wall, but certainly cost of living high on the agenda. Who else have we heard from this morning? Jacob Rees-Mogg getting rapturous applause for his plan to do a away with many EU regulations as well. Some red meat to the Tory party there. Also big applause for Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary, when he spoke about doing away with the passenger locator form, the, uh, the sort of statist intervention into people's lives that we've suffered under for the last few years. In many ways, we're hearing Conservative cabinet ministers at this conference speak to the party faithful, throwing that red meat out to the activists, the lines that they like to hear. But it's not just cabinet ministers who are making speeches today and tomorrow. Of course, we will hear, we have heard from the Chancellor, we will hear from the Foreign Secretary, we will hear from the Prime Minister tomorrow as well. But also going on today, of course, is all of the fringe events, the discussions, the training events as well that the voluntary party engage in. This is the bread and butter of the conference that might matter the most when it comes to those local elections uh, in May. Tom, thank you very much. You've managed to make it sound really exciting. I hope you have an interesting time there. Now, for weeks now, we've watched the destruction of Ukraine caused by Russian bombs. Homes and neighbourhoods absolutely laid to waste, lives lost and ruined. But the country is experiencing another type of loss too, and that is its monuments, statues, artworks and buildings, much of it at risk of vanishing forever. I travelled to the region on a trip with the UK Parliament's all-party parliamentary group on Poland to meet some of those involved in the race to preserve vital culture. Amid Ukraine's killing and carnage, the flattened apartment blocks and hospitals reduced to rubble, another, albeit lesser, tragedy is taking place. The destruction of Ukraine's rich cultural heritage. Marina works at a museum in Kharkiv, its windows and walls blown in by bombs. While many of her compatriots have stayed to fight, she's there to try to protect 25,000 artworks, many of them priceless. I have no words. I just do not understand what kind of person one must be to kill people, destroy architectural landmarks, art masterpieces, I have no words. I do not want to start swearing in front of camera. It is simply irony of the fate that we should be saving painting by Russian artists from their own nation. This is simply barbarism. Lviv across the country to the west has seen less fighting, but even here it's a race against time to protect national treasures. Dozens have been moved to underground shelters. Um, this was unexpected. Lviv survived the Soviet era. Obviously it is a shock, not only for cultural heritage, but also to our life. I never thought I would have to live like this. It's an international effort too. I travelled to the beautiful town of Szemes just across the border in Poland, where NGOs are scrambling to help. The fact is that this type of cultural heritage doesn't just stop at the border. And Ukraine has many of its own beautiful historic buildings, which are now under threat, of course, from the continual bombardment. And there are organisations now working very hard to preserve uh, the statues and monuments and indeed some of the churches, and particularly also, I was told, the stained glass in these buildings, which can so easily shatter and be lost forever. And we talked to one of these organisations about the work that they are doing to try to preserve some of the most precious buildings in Ukraine. 
Well, frankly speaking, we can remove only those things that are removable. Uh, uh, we can only uh, support, uh, su uh, support uh, these actions. We can uh, deliver some fire uh, firefighting equipment, but in case of bombing, well, I'm a citizen of Warsaw, and if you're in Warsaw today, you can see how the city was destroyed during the bombing. Yes. But we still pray and believe that it's not going to happen in the Western Ukraine. We, will, we really believe that Ukraine is going to win this war, and we support them as much as we can. It's an admirable goal, but an uphill struggle. In Odessa, in Ukraine's south, desperate measures to protect a statue of the city's founder a nervous experiment in whether sandbags can really withstand the violent terror of Putin's heavy artillery. Isabel Oakeshott, GB News. Western governments and companies need to be on a heightened state of preparedness for the high probability of cyber attacks as economic sanctions on Russia begin to bite. That's according to a senior cybersecurity expert. Critical national infrastructure in the banking sector could be the main targets, with experts warning that there are still some inherent weaknesses in these systems. Our security editor, Mark White, examines the risks and likelihoods of a major cyber attack on the West in the months ahead. Quite understandably, the world's focus of late has been on the destructive power and human cost of Russia's conventional warfare. But experts warn we mustn't underestimate the power of Russia's cyber capabilities. Although the threat from cyber warfare can seem quite abstract, it has potential real-world consequences with the ability to cripple power supplies. Health services have been significantly disrupted in the past. And the technology at the heart of the West's aviation sector is at risk. Apart from an attack on some of Ukraine's critical systems in the initial stages of the invasion, there has been no concerted effort by Russia to attack Western infrastructure in recent weeks. But as economic sanctions begin to take a real stranglehold on Moscow, Vladimir Putin is increasingly likely, we're told, to unleash his cyber capabilities. I would say there's a fairly high probability based upon the types of grey warfare, the hybrid warfare that uh, Putin uh, and the, the Kremlin have been executing against uh, others in the space to coerce um, and to bully um, its, uh, its neighbours or adversaries. Um, I think it's a weapon that's being held in reserve right now, but we certainly need to be on a, a heightened le level of, uh, of preparedness. The West banking sector is also at risk, especially as Russia has been kicked out of the SWIFT international payment system. And Russia's network of criminal gangs is another potent tool in Putin's armory. As well as being one of the most formidable cyber powers in terms of government capabilities, Russia also has the largest concentration by far of serious organized cyber crime on the planet. And before the invasion in 2021, we saw those criminals disrupt uh, petrol supplies in the US, healthcare in Ireland, schools in England, food retail in Sweden, the list goes on. If the Russian state were to, if you like, unleash its ransomware capabilities, its cyber criminal capabilities, then that could get, while it's not catastrophic, that could get pretty unpleasant. Although the West computer systems are better protected these days, there are still inherent weaknesses, vulnerabilities adversaries would look to exploit. A lot has been done to shore up um, a lot of the critical infrastructure across the UK, particularly the NHS. There are still gaps in the fabric, there are still chinks in the armour that we need to be aware exist and we need to, to take precautions compensating security controls, for example, in order to, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, perpetrators can't get through that armour. For now, Russia's main focus is on the conventional battlefield. Any cyber attack would almost certainly provoke a response in kind from the West. In fact, in the cyber domain, Russia is already fighting off multiple attacks from Western computer hackers who've turned away from their traditional targets of big business and government at home, focusing their disruptive talents on Moscow instead.
Oh, fascinating there. Thank you very much for watching. Up next, it's an extended On the Money special with Liam Halligan, who's looking at the rising fuel and food prices. And he's got an exclusive interview with the Energy Secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, on what he's doing to try to reduce your energy bills. But for now, it's the weather. Hello, I'm Alex Deakin with your latest weather update from the Met Office. A sunny day today, and there's more of that to come tomorrow as well. Feeling pretty warm by the afternoon. Just a bit more breeze picking up across the northwest of Scotland. The isobars pinching together here, but otherwise high pressure dominating our weather. Through high pressure, the air is sinking, and so we're not going to see much in the way of cloud. A little bit bubbling up through the day. Maybe some misty conditions on the east coast of Northern Ireland, perhaps the southwest of Scotland. The sunshine a little hazy in northern Scotland, where there is a breeze blowing, but otherwise it's dry, it's fine, the winds are light, and... Uh, after what was a, a bit of a chilly start this morning, temperatures picking up through the afternoon, widely into the teens, 16, 17 and 18 is just about possible. Through this evening, however, if you're heading out, just bear in mind temperatures will drop sharply. So it'll turn pretty cold pretty uh, quickly. The breeze will pick up across southern parts of England and Wales and strengthen further over northern Scotland. And with more wind around, we won't see as much fog and it won't be quite as cold. Temperatures holding up above freezing in towns and cities. But some mist and low cloud is likely across parts of northeast England. So that will make for a bit of a, a grey start here on Saturday. A chilly start generally, but a cracking start again if you like blue skies. A sunny day, but with more of a breeze certainly across the south, perhaps not feeling quite as warm as uh, today. But in Scotland, temperatures will be higher and we could, in the Highlands, get up to 19, possibly even 20 Celsius for the first time this year. It'll turn quite cool quite quickly again on Saturday evening. So again, just bear that in mind. If you're heading out, it will turn pretty chilly after a fine afternoon. The breeze continues to keep temperatures up a little bit overnight and stop a frost forming too widely. But there will be some pockets of frost on Sunday. A cloudier day for eastern England on Sunday with some showers for East Anglia, but otherwise dry and bright. But again, a little cooler come the afternoon. GB News 